Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing here at Celebration of Nations? You doing good? All right. Well, we have a, a presentation here, a project that's uh, been worked on for the last uh, couple of years, and it uh, involves uh, documenting indigenous plants along the Lower Secord Legacy Trail. The Lower Secord Le Legacy Trail basically runs from Lower Secord's homestead in Queenston, uh, th all the way along the ridge, the escarpment, through St. Catharines, up the escarpment, and then uh, uh, to uh, the Q House Heritage Park in Thorold. It's about 31, 32 kilometer distance. And so uh, there's a lot of indigenous history uh, involved in all of this. Laura Secord herself had some at least four intersections with indigenous peoples um, in her life. Uh, the first was how her family actually got to Niagara. Uh, they used to be in the eastern United States and then because they were loyalists ultimately uh, came to Canada at the recommendation of Joseph Brandt, a Mohawk leader. So that was really interesting. And uh, of course her, her uh, and that was the Ingersoll family. Uh, so uh, she married James Secord and then he gets uh, wounded in the Battle of uh, Queenston Heights. And uh, that particular battle was salvaged, if you will, by a contingent of uh, about 80 to 100 indigenous warriors who joined that, joined that bat battle as allies with Britain and turned the course of that particular battle. That was number two. Uh, number three uh, was uh, when she went on her trek, when she overheard plans for the American invasion uh, and attack, uh, she went on her trek. And uh, as she got toward the end of her journey, she encountered uh, a group of indigenous warriors. And once they, uh, by oral tradition, they said once they understood what her goal and objective was, they recognized her as an ally, shook her hand, and then ushered her the rest of the way to uh, reach Lieutenant uh, Fitzgibbon. That battle, that's three, and then that battle uh, is known as the Battle of Beaver Dams, for anybody who's a student of War of 1812 history. The Battle of Beaver Dams, and what most people don't know, is that battle was fought almost entirely by 300 uh, Mohawk Ganawagi warriors who were allies to the Crown and secured a victory over 500 American uh, forces, soldiers, and so forth. So there is this really interesting integrated history uh, with Laura Secord. And as a result of this knowledge and working with the friends of Laura Secord, um, Plenty Canada and uh, Brock University decided to do a research project investigating what indigenous plants are still there along the Laura Secord uh, Trail. So I want to introduce at this time Larry McDermott. He is the executive director of Plenty Canada, and I'll let Larry take it from here. Thank you, Tim. Um, I just wanted to, to mention uh, I, some work that uh, I did along with Megan Hamilton Mohawk, uh, a woman who completed her PhD not long ago. Uh, we were tasked with looking at the flora and fauna that impacted indigenous uh, histories uh, in the in this particular part of the world, and for me, I thought, "Oh, this will be interesting." It was fascinating, um, and a little sample is uh, this particular area, this little uh, bridge uh, between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, uh, is a way for raptors um, to head south or north, depending on, of course, the time of year, uh, utilizing the minimum amount of energy. From an indigenous perspective, there's incredible inventory of, of uh, medicines, animals, plants, um, and it would be easy <laughs> to uh, just tell the, some of those stories. They were, they were amazing. Even the geology is amazing. But um, what we're here to talk about today is uh, uh, what we're learning about the plant inventory that exists there now. And of course, there's uh, long histories, many stories. Um, and I'm also very uh, pleased with the relationship with 
Brock University, which uh, is largely led by Liette, uh, and Plenty Canada. And we had a couple of uh, wonderful students who are going to continue with us. They've actually turned down other opportunities to continue with us, which is great. Uh, both a, um, a settler and an indigenous student. So without further ado, I better turn things over to this uh, amazing panel. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you a lot uh, to uh, Tim and uh, Larry Miguesh for uh, uh, organizing also the event, uh, the Celebration of Nations, this beautiful event. I have been part of it now for a few years and I really, really appreciate it. It's a great way to really uh, celebrate the nations, but also to really see how our environment is in fact so important for all nations. I think that's the main point. So um, we will be uh, talking about uh, this uh, Laura Segar Trail. Um, and I'm hoping yeah, it works. Okay, good. And I just wanted first to, uh, to talk about uh, the, uh, the issue that we have often uh, when we look at our biodiversity, when we look at, uh, at uh, our environment. And uh, I I'm a biologist originally, uh, and um, what one thing that I know by being a professor at Brock and all that is how much uh, our science and when we stay only with a scientific way, it's really based on capitalism. Uh, it's more the exploitation and all these kind of things, and uh, it really has a reductionist approach. Uh, which I, I'm kind of the weirdo in the department uh, for quite a while, uh, that never believed that it's the best way. I like to be more uh, integrative. Uh, I, I'm now teaching, in fact, a new course called Ecosystem Ecology because I believe that this is the place. Uh, when we look at the, our universe, it's not just, and, and especially in Turtle Island, uh, we are all connected. Everything is connected. So. This is one thing, and many cultures, especially First Nations, have a different worldview than this capitalism view, and uh, that brings them to really believe on the integration, this integration and this connectedness that we have among all living organisms and the Earth. So that's the basis, I should say, for uh, the connection and, and uh, working more and more uh, with uh, Planty Canada. Uh, with Larry, with Tim, and uh, Alicia, and a lot of other people, because I really believe that this is the way to go. It's a way that we have to change the current worldview of the world and the system that we uh, that is destroying what we really should be sharing and steward at the same time. Hoping, and uh, just to say that uh, I. Now we integrate that at Brock a lot, the acknowledgement, the acknowledgement of the people from this land. And uh, I think this is very important for the students to learn, to understand the importance of that we are here as settlers and that uh, we are all trying to, uh, especially when I'm trying to convince them, to protect this land that it has to be shared and it has to be uh, put in a way that, um, that can be for the seven generations to come at least, uh, not just the short-term view that we often have. And this is a beautiful place. Uh, talking about ecosystem ecology, this is an ecosystem that is quite amazing, the Niagara. Uh, and people, when they come here, even the students, tend to just think about the falls and they don't necessarily understand that uh, there are a lot more. The animals, the plants, what Larry has been talking about, this amazing corridor that we have. In fact, uh, uh, I know that it's also the uh, flight path for the monarch butterfly. Uh, I experienced almost uh, 10 years ago, we had a very cold snap in September, and uh, the trees around our, our house had hundreds of them. And when it warm up the next day, they all left. So it really shows the importance of this area and how it's really uh, a place to cherish 
that needs to be protected. So, and it's a, it's a place where animals have been traveling because it's a bridge, but it's a bridge also for the connection with many nations and transfer an area. But it's also a way that uh, uh, in 1812, <laughs> we know, the Americans wanted to take this land. And uh, this is something that, uh, uh, if it had not been of La Rosa Car, and uh, as Tim explained, uh, all her history, uh, we probably would be American today, <laughs> unfortunately, or it all depends if you like to be American. <laughs> but <laughs> that's uh, the way that it can be, you know, we never know. And that, there are many nations uh, that have been here that, I've, uh, have, that are important to keep in mind uh, when we think about it, that they were the first people. We are settlers and uh, we have to acknowledge that this is the land that was there and you are still there today. And that's the important part. So just to uh, recap a little bit about the, uh, I'm hoping at the right place now. Yeah, <laughs> the, uh, the the project. Uh, what happened is that uh, um, that was in 2021 uh, when uh, we were discussing the uh, what I will call the reconciliation between the Niagara Escarpment Biosphere and Planty Canada, and we were discussing at the time of an opportunity uh, to get funding to be able to. Uh, do uh, some work, trying to bring back uh, this knowledge that needs to be there. And, uh, and talking with Tim and Larry, uh, we were talking about the Laura Sikor Trail and saying, okay, can we try to figure out but what is actually there now? What is left? And, uh, because we never know. And uh, so that's, uh, it started this way. Uh, and I convinced Kesha. She was just in between her honors and her uh, master's <laughs> progress. So that was great to be able to have her. And, uh, and through Tim, we were able to connect with Alicia. Uh, and this started, in fact, a very interesting process that of uh, walking along all the trail to be able to identify. And uh, I know we did only one kilometer at one point together. And I think we were there for what two or three hours <laughs> just because we were stopping every 30 seconds so that uh, <laughs> can be long that way but uh, it's a beautiful way to uh, to learn about what we have what we can cherish in terms of biodiversity in our region uh, and what we wanted to do is really take the two high, two high seeing approach in this so that we didn't just stay at an inventory of plants and we can put the scientific name, the common name in English, uh, know the, uh, the habitat and all that, but there's a lot more behind a name, but behind the plants. And that was where we really cherished the help. And I should say, she's a mad amazing woman <laughs> <laughs> who is uh, able to, to really give us the history, the meaning of what it meant and all the, what it means in terms of medicines, what it needs in terms of all these com components that uh, it's not just a plant for a plant, it's way more than that. And I think that was uh, really uh, a great collaboration. I, I should say I'm, I'm looking forward for the next step <laughs> because there, I know that we have more to do uh, and especially the biosphere. Uh, the Niagara Escarpment Biosphere is 725 kilometers. So the La Rosa Cor Legacy Trail is a very only 32, so it's not that much. So that's a bit different. And now I cannot move. Oh, oh. oh. Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll we'll go to, to the next. And then can I move? The, oh, I cannot even move the next. Can you move it for me? Okay. Is it moving? Not yet. Uh oh.
Sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> we'll see how quickly the uh, First Ontario Performing Arts Centre staff can respond. <laughs> Well, I can say that the next slide, uh, Tim explained a big part of it already. So uh, in terms of, uh, it was a photo of the Laura Socor uh, house in Queenston. Yay, okay, and you have it, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was uh, just a bit of the history, uh, the recap of the history uh, of the, uh, the, the, the journey that she took uh, to warn uh, the British that uh, the, uh, the invasion, the permanent invasion from the Americans to Canada. And uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, the importance of uh, the uh, 300 Mohawk and First, First Nations that were capable of coming to uh, really, at Beaver Dam, push back, uh, that saved quite a lot. So our journey was quite important, as you can see. And what is important is that a big part is in the escarpment. So there's a lot of, uh, of uh, work to, to do to climb and to make sure, but it's also one thing that is important. Many of these trails were already done by the First Nation for ex exchange and way of movement between communities. So it has uh, a lot of significance. And uh, we know that uh, uh, talking to other municipalities that they are highly interested to re really understand all these, you know, understand and re really trying to find where they are, the, all these trails. But for us, it was also, in 2021, was the year that uh, was um, pushed towards the, uh, because I work, I'm a UNESCO chair, uh, so I work with the, the uh, UNESCO, and they had the proposal to have the, um, the UN decade on uh, indigenous knowledge and uh, especially in, uh, indigenous languages. And uh, that was to be uh, launched in 2022. So I thought it would be also a great way to use this project to integrate language as well. And this is how this interaction became very important uh, to better uh, celebrate uh, the UN decade at the same time. So what I'll do is I'll give the, uh, the floor to both Alicia and Kasha, and they will explain a lot more uh, all this intricate. The two of them will be a duo uh, explaining all these things. If they can to start. Yeah, you can introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm so not used to doing my introduction sitting down, so I'm going to stand up. Uh, my name is Alyssa General. I'm Mohawk Nation Turtle Clan from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. I am a school teacher, <laughs> but I'm also kind of, a, I guess, a little bit of a mushroom and plant nerd, and it's kind of, as well as a huge language advocate. Um, and yeah, it did this project kind of was just beautifully encapsulated everything that I care about and love so much and it's just been such a privilege to work with Kasha and Liet and Tim on this project so Nyamagoa. Okay, she's going to introduce herself after. So um, basically, just to give everyone a kind of a little bit of a run through of what Ganyak Geha is and kind of how it factors into this project and why it's important. I wanted to kind of give a little bit of an overview of like about who we are. So Ganyak Geha is, I'm not too sure who's familiar with it. Some people have referred to it as, you know, like people of the Flint. Um, we're also known as the Mohawks. And some like, you know, we're a, a very like affiliated with like the Iroquois and the Haudenosaunee. Those are different names that we go by. But basically, like, this is some of the iconography that you can find with our people, which is the Hiawatha Belt, which is the treaty that was kind of created to help form under the Guyana Goa, the Great Law, the founding of the Haudenosaunee um, 
the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which make up the Seneca, Cayuga, On Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk nations, all under one, and later on accepting in the Tuscarora. So, which makes, if anybody's familiar with Six Nations powwow, <laughs> like Six Nations territory, that's where that's where this comes from. Um, Basically, our traditional territory was in upstate New York. In Fond like our my traditional territory as a Mohawk person is in Fonda, New York. And basically, people have often heard us as being called people of the longhouse. And the reason why this is is because we kind of formed together a, a metaphoric longhouse. So with the Mohawks on the eastern door and the Senecas on the western, it kind of created this way of a doorway in which different nations kind of interacted and um, kind of like if they wanted to bring anything or like if they wanted to kind of uh, interact with our nations at all, they had to come through the Mohawks and the Senecas. So it's almost like there was a door on each end. And actually nowadays in longhouses that we have today, there is like that same kind of like protocol. So one interesting little geographical factor about um, the our territory and speci like specifically with Mohawks is there is these diamonds that you find there that are called Herkimer diamonds, and they're only found in that specific region of upstate New York. And the one thing that's kind of cool about this is that when you take the word Ganyakehaga, which is our word for Mohawk, some people take it and say, well, actually it means like, it ends up meaning people of the crystal or people of the chert, which is what the formation that helps to create these stones. And so it's kind of interesting that like even within our own language, it recognizes our relationship that we have to the land and kind of like where we are geographically and where we fit into the scheme of this, all of this, um, the, the forming of the Confederacy. So I thought it was a little kind of cool tidbit to throw in there just to kind of give everyone a little bit of an idea of like of, of where the language comes from. But I also am going to talk a little bit about how it works as well. So for some reason, my, I'm not too sure why, the one part's not showing up on here. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so the way the language works, um, Mohawk is called a polysynthetic language. And I'm not too sure if anybody's really familiar with how that, what that means, but basically it means that one, sent, one word in Ganyageha can equal a sentence. So when I say something like, that means the earth in which I come from, and that's referring to my nation. Things like that, like that, that they encompass so much more than one, than one thing. Like you know, and I remember when I started learning like Ganyat Geha, one of our teachers would say, "Okay, I want you to talk about a table. Tell me what a table is. What does that word mean?" And I, I, everybody was just drawing a blank. We're like, "I don't know." He's like, "Well, in Ganyat Geha, it means you say adequara, and it's the thing that holds the food up." So when you kind of get into thinking about the language in that way, you start to realize that even with the terms of pronouns, so we have objective, subjective, and transitive, which when you kind of put them all together, they talk about the relationship that you have with whatever you're interacting with. So like when I'm saying objective, I mean like it to me. So it means that I have no control over this thing that's happening. So I'm sick. I have no control over getting sick, so it's just something that naturally occurs. Or genuous, I like something, and it's saying I to something else, I like it. Or saying something like, Yatit Nistaha, our mother, and how that incorporates, like Yatit Nistaha means like, her, all of us to her, or sorry, her to all of us, basically. Like, she is our mother. And the other thing that's really kind of interesting about Ganyakeha is it's verb-based. So basically everything is an action or everything is talking about what that thing does. So in, in terms of having something like nouns, we don't really typically have like, I want to say like noun nouns where they don't really, you know, kind of like where it's like cup, like phone it's nothing like that it all has to do with what it does so like a phone is deaterakwa you use it to talk uh nigerakwa it holds water or it holds something to drink so things like that where it's like you're actually like it talks about the utility of it what it's used for what it's meant for and the reason why i wanted to explain all this before we kind of got into talking about um the like the translations that we created for the plants um was because when you take out 
the language, you take out the relationship and you take out the understanding of how it is used. And so it's important in order for like language, and, and I guess in terms of cultural preservation, you really need to know, oh, sorry, you really need to know like, like, like in terms of cultural preservation, you really need those little tidbits of things, those little pieces of information that like, that include your, the relationship, that include the usage, and how that all comes together and, and forms like what we thought about things because now when we come into the world we have like there's so many new things that like we're starting to have to create lexicons for like new words that are coming in um, because like we don't like you know we never had a word for a phone or had a word for a computer and so it's it's been interesting to kind of be part of, part of projects where you're hearing speakers say well I would say it this way but it encapsulated it encapsulates so much of how we relate to what we're talking about and so I wanted to kind of bring that to the forefront and the reason why I chose the imagery that I chose is because when you think about the the relationships the relationship aspect of the language it kind of comes through in in terms of like the way that we acknowledge and always recognize treaty relationships and work to uphold them because to those, those are to us, those are like a living document, and they are a reflection of a relationship that we've built with other with other nations. And the same, like I have a picture up here done by Orin Lyons of the Guyana Goa and the founding of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And I had just kind of wanted to bring that in because it was talking about like building relationships and maintaining them, and the fact that like you know this when we kind of like when, when you do a little bit of studying with a uh, guy on like goa and dating it back to almost like the 1100s like it's it's interesting that we have such like a strong a strong bond with our history not just because it's oral but because we have built it through connection like and how we connect to each other and how we connect to the earth so i'm just um showing a way that our the language um, kind of pulls together, like flows together. And there'll be more examples of this as we continue on. Um, but the example I gave here was Dewadatrex. Um So when you break it down, means like us to it. And the da is like a reflexive. So it means it's happening back to ourselves. So Dewadatrex. And like trex, the, uh, the suffix there means to push. And so when we say dewadatrex, we mean like this is to push ourselves. The other word I was thinking of for this one was which means like my mind is hardened, which is another word, way that we talk about stubbornness or determination. <laughs> so I thought like those were kind of fitting ones. And I, I heard this word when I was chatting with um, some speakers about language revitalization. And I've, they were talking about the, the push, the want to push themselves to become more fluent and proficient in the language. So I thought it was like a kind of like a fitting little piece here. So I have a quiz for you all. Be ready. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to read this word, and I want everyone in the audience to do a raise of hands when I say A, B, C, or D, um, which one you think it is, because you're already fluent a bit in Ganyat Geha, and you don't even know it. <laughs> so I have Ganyat Rio. What does Ontario, this is the word for Ontario, what does it mean? Does it mean A, a nice river? No show of hands. B, a nice lake? Got two, all right. C, a large lake? One, okay. And or D, lake of shining waters? All right, for those of you, the two that suggest <laughs> that, that picked a nice lake, this is what it means. So, Ganyadirio means a nice lake. Um, it can also mean a pretty lake, depending on the context. But um, so Onyadira is how you say a lake, and Leo. Anytime you see a Leo suffix at the end of there, it's always something good. <laughs> so on to the next one. There's two more. Onyagara. So Onyagara is our word for the Niagara. This is the one that we use for Niagara. So does it mean a narrowing river? Show of hands, anybody for A? No. B, the spine. No, oh, no. C, thundering waters. 
Oh, okay. That's a pretty good one. D. Vanek. Oh, there's two for okay. A three. Okay, we got three. All right. So I will give half a point to those who pick Thundering Waters because technically the the way that we refer to this is the place of the thunder beings. Um, because a lot of our legends and a lot of our stories kind of come back to this um, that this region in particular and have to deal with these thunder spirits. But the correct answer is D, the neck. And the reason why it's called the neck is because the Niagara River acts as a conduit from Lake Erie into, um, into Lake Ontario. So if you think of it kind of like, I guess like, you know, Lake Erie is the mouth, the neck is... Lake is the Niagara River, and then the stomach is Lake Ontario. That's kind of what that's kind of what it's referring to. Our next one, Adelundo. Some people might hear Jitkurundo for this as well. Um, there's actually quite a few translations for this one, but they all kind of roundabout mean the same thing. So this is our word for Toronto. So does it mean a standing trees? Show of hands. One, two. B, maple trees. We got one. C, place of the trees. We got more for that one. Or D, floating trees. All right, for those of you who picked floating trees, D, floating trees, that was the correct answer. Um, basically, adurundo refers to the log portion of the tree, like the trunk portion. And the O at the end, it like kind of denotes that something's in water. Um, so it's basically like kind of a, denoting a little bit of the history of um, of Toronto and of the waterways there and how like logs were floated down from up north down this route and a lot of the times you would see like kind of like um, logs in the water along the lake there so it's a little bit of like I guess like a little interesting connection between the language the history of the land and also the um, yeah like the the real true meaning and and I'll wrap up like wrapping this up um, we have two beautiful pieces from Christy Belcour and Erwin Printop Jr. And there were so many other pieces I could have pulled from because whenever you look at indigenous art, it is always reflective of the like the connection that we have with creation. So and it's and to me I'm like that is such like a reflection of the mindset that we have as Haudenosaunee people, as Ungwe Hoi people. So when you ever you look at like artwork by Norval Morriso, like Arthur Schilling, David General, Carl Beam, all of it reflects our history and it also reflects this connection that we have to our land because when you when you think about it, that, that connection that is, is so important to us and it's so much of what we stand for today as, as, as Ongoy Hongoy people, as, um, as Native people and Indigenous people, it's, so much of it is entrenched in what we carry in our language and our culture. And I was once told when I was younger, when I was first started learning that when you take the language away, 70% of the culture dies. And so I think to me that was like the biggest pull to like make sure that I was maintaining my language because I was going to go for it and maintain the culture with it. And that it's important to keep these connections because without it, we would forget our, our relationship with the land. You know, like everybody says, Oh, like yeti ni sta hanjio hanjade when we're doing the Thanksgiving address, and the reason why we're doing that is because we're calling that relationship that we have to the earth as being our mother. Whereas if you just call it earth, it's so devoid of that what what this what this role truly is, what it really truly fulfills for us that it is like a mother that it is caring for us that it is providing everything that we need to sustain ourselves. And also looking at things like jenhekwan, the word jenhekwan, which is our word that we use for food. So when we give thanks, we say, and the reason why we, we talk about that, that word, and use that word specifically in reference to food is because it means that it gives us life. It sustains our life. So when you take it out and you, you, know, you just call your food food, 
you're not thinking about that this plant has to do so much in order to provide for you, in order to fulfill you, in order for you to be able to live like the longest that you can and that it offers up so much. So there's so much more relationship that is built into our language and it's embedded in our culture. And that's why it's important to preserve this, preserve these things, to preserve our language, preserve our culture, and preserve this worldview so that our future generations know what they're inheriting and know what the responsibility is. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alyssa and Liette. Um, my name is Kasia Skorzynski. I'm honored to be a part of this panel. I'm a master's student with Liette, and throughout my career, I've studied native plants. And particularly right now, I'm looking at their relationships with insects. So a lot of the time when I'm identifying plants, I think of their um, name in Latin. And this is part of taxonomy. So taxonomy is like the scientific classification of plants. Um, they say these two are kind of like the fathers of taxonomy, where Theophrastus was around 371 to 287 BC, and he was a Greek philosopher who classified plants by their leaf characteristics, which a lot of times that can be a little bit deceiving in terms of their relationships. And then Carl Linnaeus came around a fair bit later in 1707 to 1778, and he developed the binomial naming system, which some of us may be familiar with. When you see a species name, um, you see the genus name and the specific epithet. So the specific epithet is kind of like an adjective that describes that species within that genus. And using this binomial nomenclature naming system, Linnaeus classified about 4,400 animals and 7,700 plants by their sexual characteristics. So their sexual characteristics um, we're finding more genetically tend to be a little bit more indicative of their relationships um, along the phylogenetic tree. So this is the rank-based scientific classification system that we often use to identify plants in science. And it starts with the most broad um, at kingdom, and that would be kind of like the, um, sort of like the base of the tree would be the different kingdoms, like lower down in the nodes. Then you have more uh, descriptive, different kind of classifications like division, order, family, genus, and species. So, they get more specific as you go along and you branch off on that phylogenetic tree. Now, there is also, I'd like to mention, a lot of push now to incorporate more indigenous names and indigenous language into naming, uh, naming different species and even going back and renaming a lot of the different species that have already been named um, it's to honor those relationships that people have had with these plants with these organisms for you know thousands of years so we'll start um, basically the way that these plants are organized in this presentation is kind of like walking along the trail so the first plant would have been closer to the homestead where the last plant would be at the DQ house. So the first plant that we're looking at is staghorn sumac. And the species name for that is Rus typhina. It's in the Anacardiaceae family. So that's also a family with cashews in it. And one way that you can really tell these plants apart is those um, pinnately compound leaves. So you see that, that on the right image there, Basically, that whole structure is like one leaf, and it's just divided into leaflets. And then they've got that very kind of hairy, fuzzy uh, stem. And they're found, they're kind of like a pioneer species, where they're found um, kind of going into different areas on the edges of woodlands and things like that, where they can get a bit of sun there. And so the Ganyageha name for this is Dardagui. And unfortunately, sometimes when like ethnographers were, were like, you know, um, writing down our names they kind of took it like one for one and so there was a little bit of like a translation loss in some of this um, but fortunately enough like the story for this has still remained quite intact um, so there's a story about 
uh, they call them Ogwardi Goa, and it's in reference to a constellation that appears, but it's also in reference to a story about um, three hunters who are hunting a bear, and when they finally kind of track it down to shoot it, uh, its blood spills out and changes the leaves' colors. And they, one of the ones that is like specifically named for this time is uh, Daragui, uh, sumac. So sumac, it, for our people, is an indicator of when hunting needs to start. Um, when it, a little cute little si aside from it, my daughter um, has been raised in the language since she was little, but when she was, I think like wh when she had first heard the story, she'd heard it all the way up, and um, as like she got older, I remember she was walking outside and she was wearing a Carhartt jacket and she walked outside and she walked back in and I was like, what's the matter? She's like, oh, the sumacs are red. It's hunting season. I can't wear deer colors anymore. <laughs> So I thought that was super cute that it was like, oh, like the culture is really alive and it's really like living in her. So that's so awesome to hear like little things like that, like um, being carry, carried forward. But yeah. And that's kind of neat too, because the uh, staghorn sumac, the staghorn comes from that fuzzy uh, branching that's similar to the horns of the stag as well. So that's all kind of connected in that sense as well. Then we have sassafras, sassafras albitum. It's in the laurel family, Lauraceae, which also has a number of other kind of fragrant plants such as spice bush and cinnamon. And sassafras is neat too because it's got these leaves that have multiple morphologies. So it can be like have the three lobes that you see in the picture there. It can have one lobe on one side, another lobe on the other side, like, like mittens like a pair of mittens and it can also just be a simple leaf without those lobes so it's a it's a great host species as well and uh and yeah and the translation for this one it kind of always makes me laugh because it's like and it like kind of says that its skin stinks <laughs> it just means it's it smells <laughs> Oh, it's um but if you've ever like broken sassafras it's got like a very citrusy smell and then also the roots are kind of like key in making root beer so mm -hmm. then there's common milkweed which is probably most famous for being a host species for monarch butterflies which many of us might know that it's been listed the monarch has been listed as an endangered species now so that's asclepius syriaca in the apocynaceae family that's the dogbane family. So a lot of the members of this family are actually quite poisonous. And the monarch kind of uses that to its advantage, where it ingests the tissue as a caterpillar, and it gives it a little bit of defense against um, predators. So different kinds of milkweeds will have different levels of toxicity within that like milky latex um, component that's, the, that's within the milkweed. So, so the monarchs tend to choose the milkweed species that have a little bit more of that toxicity, and this is definitely one of them. And so the name for this one is Otsehuanda. Um, that I'm not unfortunately like not quite as clear on the translation for this one, but it is kind of like seems very related to Otsekerawanda, which is our word for honey. Uh, and I'm not too sure if like that's kind of like what draws like the sweetness from like well, even though it's it's toxic. <laughs> <laughs> but the flower itself like draws so much like monarch butterflies and draws like the a lot of pollinators to it so um but yeah that's kind of like what a little bit of what the name sounds like it might be preferring to and i even just thinking of that i've definitely seen on the flowers it's almost like little clusters of nectar where it's almost like crystallized on them it's really beautiful and then we have the um, broadleaf cattail, so Typha latifolia in the Typhaceae family. So there's also a European um, cattail that is very common along with this one in our area. It's called Typha angustifolia, and sometimes they'll hybridize as well. Um, but broadleaf cattail can be distinguished largely because the leaves tend to be about an inch wide. They're quite a bit wider than the European introduction, the Typha angustifolia, tends to have much more narrow leaves. And there's also a difference in the way that the, the seeds, the fruits are spread out, but you don't see it as much in this photo. But, um, but it's a wetland plant, so you, you, wherever you see cattail, you can feel assured that the soil is quite saturated. And the Ganyakeha name for this one is Onoda. And Onoda refers to kind of like the, the top part of like the plant. Um, and 
actually culturally significant about this plant uh, is um, kind of like the fluff of it. And that's a little bit of what this is referring to. So there's a word in our language that is, I'm not too sure, a raise of hand who's ever read braiding sweetgrass. Anybody in the, in the audience? Oh, we have got quite a few. So there was a section in that where, um, where she talked about um, cattail. And the, the real translation for it is deo no dadum. And deo no dadum or deha no dadum means that they've been downfended or they've been protected. Um, and it's in reference to our creation story. I think she had a little bit more of like a, a flowery uh, way of describing it in, in the book, but what it means technically is that they've been protected or they've been downfended. And it kind of goes back into creation story when um, Sky Woman and her brother were born. And this, I'm not too sure who's really kind of has an in depth knowledge of the Iroquois cosmology, but. Um, so many people know that it's like Sky Women fell on landed on Turtle's back, but there's like a whole backstory. <laughs> it's kind of like as as Ohonjage turns, <laughs> kind of like soap opera esque. But like um, it has this whole story about how her and her her and her brother were there was like where they were living was had down placed the down of this particular plant placed all around it so that they um, they were able to know when somebody was coming into the house and know when somebody was coming like leaving and the reason why they wanted those kids to be remain protected because and it kind of goes into a lot of teachings that we have about like oherogo like our, our rites of passage and stuff like that um but basically it was that they wanted these kids to remain kind of like remain children for as long as they possibly could and to have their innocence for as long as they possibly could and and to kind of have their minds like raised in a good way and so that's kind of like a little bit of the story of like of this plant and how its name kind of gets pulled into other parts of our culture Amazing. okay and then we have the american bladder nut also known as staphylia trifolia in staphyliaceae family it's actually a pretty small family with only about three genera within it so the trifolia refers to that trifoliate leaf. So kind of how I talked about before with the sumac, where you have that pinnately compound leaf. This one is pinnately trifoliate. So each leaf is actually made up of three leaflets. And the terminal leaflet has that little bit of a stem on it, that pedial that connects it to the other two. So you can see a little bit in that picture where the two on the base don't have too much of a pedial and then the third one on the tip has much more of one. And it's got those amazing papery uh, fruit capsules as well, those seed capsules. And the Ganyakeha name for this one is Gastawon Zernota. Um, the word ostawa is in here, like there's a root in here that is ostawa, and basically what that is referring to is it being rattle-like. And actually, the really quite, kind of cool thing about these plants in particular is that you harvest the seeds in the wintertime, and they're used in rattle-making. Amazing. And also, um, just another thing about it is I've seen these plants grow in so many different types of habitats from woodlands to woodland edges to even on sand dunes they're really common so it's a, it's an amazing plant then we have canada wild ginger a serum canadense in the aristolochiaceae family so this family actually has a lot of vines and a lot of flowers that look like little pipes this one however looks more like a like an open bell and it's on the ground so it's often pollinated by things like beetles and slugs and ground dwelling organisms and it's interesting because there's a tree black walnut that has an allelopathic property and that means that it sort of sends out metabolites through its roots that inhibit the growth of other plants around it um, where i've seen uh, wild ginger growing around black walnut, wild ginger actually thrives. So it must somehow bypass this allelopathy of the black walnut and just kind of, uh, and just flourish within its environment. And so the Ganyakeha name for this one is Jonas Squarnier. It's, we were talking about this in a conversation because I'm like, I cannot figure out what the, the root of it is, but it's talking about one something being stirred. And this plant is like, it's, a, it's used a lot for cold medicines. And the one thing that's really super interesting about it is that we also took the name of this plant and ended up putting it on a um, non-indigenous plant, Colt's foot, 
and because they have like a similar usage. And so it was kind of, I think there's like, if you, if you look through our history, we have like a habit of being like, oh, like, oh no, there's something similar. Like, let's, we're gonna use the same name for it because they serve the same purpose. <laughs> so yeah. it's interesting in that aspect. Mm -hmm. So we have black cherry as well, Pruna serotina in the rosaceae family. So black cherry, um, you can often distinguish it in a forest because it has that bark that some people say it looks almost like burnt cornflakes. It's got these little plates that kind of come up around the edges and it's quite dark and beautiful. And then the leaves, on the backs of the leaves along the midrib, you have kind of like this fuzz, and sometimes it's a little yellow, sometimes it's a little orange, but out of the cherries, that's the only one that has that kind of fuzz. And then with prunus, the genus, so like plums and cherries, they actually have these little glands at the base of the leaf that um, act as extra floral nectaries. So they'll actually attract insects to those little glands and they'll come and sip a little bit of nectar from those, from those glands, even though they're not on a flower, they're extra floral. And the interesting thing about this word, if you walk away with a word today, you will walk away with the word airdy because it is so close to cherry. And so this was like one of the things kind of like coming up. We decided to include this one because it might be one of those cases where the word was borrowed um, just because of like this, the similarity in the name. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, this is like, this is the word that we use for cherry like currently. But as you kind of kind of go through um, different legends of ours, you start to realize that there was like, there was some times where the language was shifting and changing. And this might've been one of those circumstances. Okay, next we have Northern Red Oak, um, Corcus rubra in the Phagaceae family. So that's also the family with beeches and chestnuts. And the rubra refers to the red of the Northern Red Oak. Uh, one way to distinguish between the red oak group and the white oak group is red oaks have more pointy lobes and then the white oaks have more smooth rounded lobes. One thing I love about red oaks as well is that they're an amazing host species. They host over um, 500 different species of butterflies and moths, lepidopterans, and they also host many flies and wasps and things like that as gulls. So um, often when you look at an oak, you see these like growths on the leaves and those are ca caused by insects that will lay their eggs inside of the leaf and then the larva will create this like habitat for itself so that it can develop within the leaf and it creates these amazing huge balls um, of different shapes and different colors. So they're quite the ecological nurturer. And the Gariakeha name for this one is Gurito. Um, it kind of sounds like it's broken or something has been broken. Um, so it's kind of interesting. But the one thing that's kind of funny, a little bit of a side, like how I said, where we place names for things that we, you know, oh, it looks like this plant or it does the same responsibility. So Gurito is also the word that we use for police because back in the day, the way that their helmets were shaped looked like acorns. <laughs> So that ended up being like, even when I, I remember when I first learned that, because we use a different word um, in an Oswego dialect. But when I went out um, out to east towards like Ganawaga, Aguasasne, Ganasatagale, they say Gardito. And I'm like, Gardito, like, like an oak? They're like, no, no, it's like ref reference to like their hats, the way their hats looked. I was like, oh, okay. So it was cute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And trembling aspen, Populus tremuloides, in the Salicaceae family, which is also the willow family, um, another big group with lots of uh, host species relationships with insects. And the trembling aspen, the petiole, so the little stem of the leaf, is actually quite flat. And that adds to that trembling aspect when the wind catches it. And it's also a pioneer species. So it'll be one of the first to start to grow on disturbed land or in a prairie as the prairie is naturally going through succession, turning into a forest, that kind of thing. And the Ganyageha name for this one is Onerat Dunda, which we thought was kind of interesting because it kind of talks about like the way that the leaves move. And yeah, so it was like, oh, cute. Like, um, and it's one of those things where it, it could be a lexicon word where it was more recently developed rather than like um, a kind of like an older, an older, um, I guess like an older word for it. Mm. 
Slippery Elm, Almus rubra in the Almaceae family. So Slippery Elm is one of three native elms. The other two are Rock Elm and American Elm. And uh, Dutch Elm disease has really been doing a number on the elm populations, but uh, Slippery Elm is actually a little bit more resistant than the other two native elms. And that's a fungal pathogen that is spread by a beetle and um, Dutch Elm. So of course it's been introduced from Europe as well. And one way that you can tell an elm often is at the very base of the leaf where the where the leaf reaches the petiole, it's kind of offset the two sides on the uh, where the midrib turns into the petiole. It's kind of offset. So they call it an oblique base. And the Karyakeha name for this one is Ogurna. And it's kind of interesting because that is also kind of like a word used for like mask. But um, the thing that's interesting and like really helpful work for, with slippery elm is it's used for like a, to help induce child labor. Yeah, now often when you see an elm in the wild, they'll be quite young because the fungus is pretty um, aggressively attacking the older specimens. So most of the elms that you see in the wild are, are immature. Then we have red osier dogwood, Cornus cerisea in the Cornaceae family. And red osier dogwood, you may be familiar with it, with those bright red stems. Um, it's a shrub. Again, it's very versatile. It can be found near wetlands and woodlands on edges and on your prairies and stuff like that. And it's dogwoods have these characteristic leaves where the veins kind of go against the edge of the leaf and it gives them a really kind of beautiful delicate look with that and it's got white berries in the fall which is um good to remember if you see something again with a red stem that looks like a dogwood it might also be silky dogwood but that one has blueberries so there's and there's differences in the leaves and stuff like that too and so the name for this one is um, The significance of this one is they actually, in our creation story, they say this is one of the first plants that um, some Guayadiso planted. And it it has like a whole bunch of like different uses. I feel like as you kind of like go through, it's, it's um, if you go through like a lot of our legends, it pops up so much. And one of the ways that it was used, um, Keely was creating, um, used to create arrows. So it's it's neat. I remember chatting with um with a uh, with a fellow about like the process of like how you would collect them and things like that. So it's yeah, it was like a, a really really widely utilized not only like for as it like as a utility item but also as a medicine as well. So it looks like the screen may have disconnected again, but um, I'm not sure. Did you get to see a picture of the red osier dogwood? You did. Okay, great. I'll switch over and then. I'll talk about the next one. We'll describe its appearance anyway. So the next one is sycamore, Platinus occidentalis in the Platinaceae family. And sycamore is, it has that um, characteristic bark that almost looks like it's kind of peeling. And it, it has almost like a camouflage kind of appearance. And then the leaves do look quite a bit like maple leaves. Um, so often when you're seeing like street trees and stuff like that, they think, oh, I think that might be a sycamore. You may also be seeing a London plane tree and London plane trees, they have perfect. They have, um, they're a hybrid between the American sycamore and the Oriental sycamore. So they, the base layer of the London plane tree, that bark is more, a little bit yellow, a little bit green, whereas on the American sycamore, um, it's quite white and bright. I love this tree. <laughs> there's like, there's a story that I have about this tree that I absolutely love, but um, I'll introduce it first. So it's utter.deetzer.goa. And the reason why I like it is because um, a long, a little while ago, I was visiting a Onondaga speaker in upstate New York and we went for a hike together. And he goes like, how do you say sycamore in your language? I was like, I'm actually not too sure because I've, it's not in the, it's not in like the tree list that I have. And he goes, oh, he's like, well, that's interesting. He goes, here we call it like adadit sakona. And he goes, but I don't understand why we call it that because we call socks and mullen the same thing. And I had to think about it. I'm like, it's called adadit sakona. He goes, yeah, that's what you'd call it. And I was like, why would they call it that though? Because I was like, this is so interesting. So we had to like, I kind of thought about it. And I used to work at a plant nursery 
And one of the things that we were always warned is that you're supposed to wear masks when you're working with sycamores because they release a fuzz that's a lot like um, this itchy fuzz that's kind of a lot like insulation. And I was like, oh my gosh, like all of these things are fuzzy. <laughs> All of these things are fuzzy and all of these things are itchy. So it was kind of like this like little like pulling all together, like all the reasons why like we would have connected all of these things together. So it's, you know, you got socks as adarati and then you have um, mullen, which is also referred to as adarati and then you have adarati tsuragoa, the big sock <laughs> or like the big fuzzy itchy thing. <laughs> Okay, and then we have common bone set, Eupatorium perfoliatum in the Asteraceae family. So perfoliatum, that specific epithet comes because it um, comes from the fact that it's perfoliated. So if you look closely, you may be able to see basically where the leaves come together. It's almost like it's one big leaf going all the way across and the stem kind of pierces through it. And it's in the Asteraceae family, which when you look at that picture on the left and you see all of those, they look like little flowers, they're actually little clusters of flowers. So each of those clusters where you see the dark spot, that's a separate little floret. And each of those florets will then, if they're pollinated, turn into a seed. So they call it a capitulum, where it's like a head of flowers, a little, um, a little collection of florets. And the Ganyakeha name for this one was Deo, oh my gosh, Deo not which means that its leaves are kind of like, their leaves are pierced because they're a perfoliated species. Um, but um, this is a one word that I think was also a lexicon word, which it means that it's more, um, it's more recent. Whereas the sycamore, um, or the other Ditsaragoa, they had dated back to the 1700s, so. Cool. Okay, and then we have Eastern Hemlocks, Suga canadensis in the Pinaceae family. So Eastern Hemlock, kind of like when we talked earlier about trembling aspen as a pioneer species, this is on the other side of the time scale, it's a climax species. So these, are, these trees are often found in more mature forests and they have kind of the breadth of relationships within those forests to kind of express that. And the word for this one is Onanda Uwe, which means that it's an old, like it's the original, the original, because um, if you hear like Ongwe Uwe, it means the original people. So Onanda Uwe is the original, um, the original pine. And an interesting little fact about this one, because I'm like, I really, really like mushrooms. Um, but the one thing that was kind of cool about this is that uh, there was, what, how, how do we describe it? Oh, like the, the name, the Latin name for, um, the Latin name for, oh my gosh, varnish shelf or um, rishis is like, is uh, Ganoderma tsuga. And then like the, the Latin name for this one is tsuga canadensis. So we were talking about the relationships. Um, Cassia and I were talking about the relationships between like plant species, trees, and then also have it, how fungi fits into this as well. So kind of coming back to that like interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. And then we have woodland strawberry, Frigaria vesca in the Rosaceae family. So a neat thing about strawberries is when you look at the fruit, you think, oh, that's the fruit. But really, the individual little brown seed-looking things that you see on it, they're the fruit. And the swollen red portion is the receptacle of the, of the swollen receptacle of the flower. So it's called a multiple fruit. And it's kind of like... Um, every one of those little seeds was was pollinated separately through the different um, reproductive organs that were in the center of the flower. And this one is Dionhundessa, and it basically just means that the leaves are short. Uh, one thing that was kind of interesting about this, I was working on a different project where we were looking at, um, so the word, the, the word, Kyuga word for Dionhundessa is Jisundak. And one of the things that was interesting is I was reading through this story and I'm like, they keep talking about Jisundak, Jisundak, but like, and it was as, as um, something to help help fight off the cold after like, like after a really like terrible winter. Um, and one of the things that was interesting about it, I'm like, why are they referring to this? But it's not the Latin name. We were kind of clued into that. It wasn't the Latin name. And because the Latin name was Pontantilla uh, Canadian, Canadiensis, Canadensis, there you go. But um, 
it was a sink foil and what we ended up finding as we were kind of digging up this research about it is like that it's also known as barren strawberry so like another instance of where we're n like we're naming um we're naming species the same name but they per like they look similar but they're like serving different purposes oh disappeared on our last plant i think but i'll just kind of um just a segue even to this to this species so basically uh, we only we chose just a few of the highlights from the plants that were along the trail but we encourage everyone to check out the laura secor trail and see if you can find some of these species and maybe some other species that you might be able to learn something about and the last one brings us to the end of the trail where there is the um, First Nations Peace Monument and it's the Eastern White Pine. And the Eastern White Pine is uh, also known as Pinus strobus. It's in the Pinaceae family. And one way that you can tell between the white pines, the white pine group and the red pine group is that the white pines have clusters of five needles, whereas the red pines have clusters of two, so or sometimes three. So that's an easy way. And it kind of gives a bit of a soft texture as you rub up against it. And another name for white pine is soft pine. I always thought it was because it was so soft, but it's actually because of the soft wood versus hardwood kind of situation. So there it is. Perfect. And this tree is incredibly significant to us as Ongwehoi as um and as Haudenosaunee. Um, so Jonarat does it Goa, and the sound of it is like there's like one. It almost sounds like it's one. Sometimes like translating from Ganyakeha to English is not so one to one, but it's like um one large new leaf. And when I think about this, it always kind of makes me think about like I'm not too sure who has seen the Hiawatha belt, but there in the middle there there is that gigantic kind of leaf that is actually supposed to be symbolic of like a fire and also of a tree of this tree in particular, um, because like it has five needles. They talk about it being um, representative of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the five coming together, uh, the five nations coming together. Um, it was also the tree that like I'm not too sure how much you guys have watched heritage moments, but there was like used to be a heritage moment about the founding of the great law and how they uprooted the tree and threw like their um threw their weapons down and put it back up and this is the tree that they this is the tree they would have used um yeah and so if you're not familiar with it the term bury the hatchet comes <laughs> comes from this uh this particular instance but it holds such a an important purpose because one of the things that like this tree in particular can grow so tall it is like when you go into the forest and if it's like a forest where this this tree has thrived for a long time they are the tallest tree in the forest and one of the things that, the reasons why it paid such like played such an important role in our confederacy is because when they said that there is an eagle that is perched on top of this tree and when danger is coming this is like how it is, this is like that um, the eagle is going to tell us kind of like, or give us a warning of this happening. And, it, and, and to me, like it kind of like talks about, and I guess like in a very metaphoric way, the Confederacy coming together to, to kind of like handle like different political issues that would pop up because um, the center fire would be like the, the Onondagas. And so then you're drawing all of the nations in, in to kind of like help consolidate and help come to resolution for different things that are coming up. So this tree plays like, plays such a huge part in our history. And as you had seen before the, in, in the painting Orin Lyons had painted, that, that was reflecting the same, tr the same tree, the, um, the Jonanat Daze Goa. And it's also the tree that we refer to. Um, there is a, um, if you guys ever get a chance to Google, there is a tree called the Everlasting Tree Belt which is interestingly enough the named like the school that I work for is named after <laughs> this wampum belt scarlet hyaz at goa jonerat does at goa um, but basically it's it's talking about um, kind of like leading the way for our like leading leading the way and like carrying on um, our culture, our language, and our traditions for future generations to grab onto. So they talk about like the right, the white roots of peace, and always upholding that peace. And that's part of what that wampum belt talks about. So, yeah. So a lot of lot of um, intention and a lot of culture and a lot of knowledge within this this single tree species. Amazing. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Well. Mm -hmm.
if we have any questions or anything like that for for any of us. I I'm going to hit the top professor there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I completely agree. And uh, this is why uh, even the uh, new course, Ecosystem Ecology, there will be two lectures. So uh, uh, so that means <laughs> quite a lot for the students to, uh, to, to really get into that, plus a lab, I should say. So th they're going to get that. And, I sh uh, and this is something that uh, we have been, uh, Larry and I, discussing also with uh, the um, field course I teach, uh, Biodiversity in the, in the Biosphere Reserve, and uh, which will change for Biosphere Region. I have to put that in uh, the Senate. Uh, and uh, one thing that we want to have is at least uh, a full day uh, on, on 10 days that the students will be uh, really learning. I, I strongly believe that it has to be put in uh, universities, in classes, in undergrad. Uh, they have to learn uh, about that. I'm in the biology department and I should say that uh, when I suggested that, uh, many people were uncomfortable at the beginning, uh, but now it's coming, I should say, at Brock because we have uh, uh, quite a strong leadership pushing now for indigenous, indigenization uh, and decolonization so that uh, it's becoming more normal now to integrate that in our courses. So, um, and I should say I've been doing that a little bit uh, in general ecology as well, uh, especially when we go also in the field. So that uh, and my students, they know <laughs> when we go in the field, uh, I will always talk about, uh, you know, these plants are traditional plants, are the, and it's important to bring, even if it's just a little bit that we know, so that they can understand that they have to start thinking about differently. What is Mother Earth? Very much so, and I think that it, it just kind of reflected like the need to come together. That, because um, when you, I'm not too sure how many people are really familiar with the Great Law or like are the, the founding of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, but it was founded out of war and it was founded out of loss. Like the Hiawatha Belt was, he had lost all his family and lost all his daughters and, and was in such despair and it was about um, coming out of that despair but needing others. And, need, and having to come together to become stronger. So I think that like that's, that symbolism speaks so well to it about like, you know, like that the roots are shallow and so that the tree does need extra care and it needs, it needs a community, it needs people working together to ensure that it doesn't topple over and to ensure like its longevity for the future generations to come. So I always think of, I, I do like, I, I've thought about that before because I'm like, it's so interesting that we, we picked a tree like to, to be the hallmark of, of our, of our um, culture that had such a shallow root system, but it was like we knew that there was more work that needed to be done and that we couldn't just do it alone. 
and that it couldn't be done alone. We needed to come together to do it. <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> but it's interesting because uh, I work in China. And uh, in China, when a pine goes down, they bring it back up. So when you were talking, I was thinking, are, can all the people bring back, bring in back the topple tree? Mm -hmm. And that's another component. I don't know. That will be something to look at because I'm, I'm so fascinated by that tree. And actually, it, it pops up too because there's a, there's um there's a song that was created when there was a bit of conflict happening in Aquasasne, and if if you look up it up, I believe it was um, written by a woman named Bear Fox, um, but it was like um, it basically it it's like Skana Gasatna Sera Ganigoni Hio Sewa Guego Dewa Daro Dosa Sha Ashena Ne Donerata Zekoa. And it basically is talking about like the concepts of which like our confederacy came together, which was peace, power, and Gus at like um or sorry, oh my gosh, I threw in some Mohawk there. Skana Gus at and Gat Nigorneo, which is like peace, a good mind, and and power. And what you when like you kind of think about those things all together. I sat with an elder from Aquasasni who said, I want you to think about what the word skana means. Because and everybody was like, it means peace. He's like, no, it doesn't. It just think about it more. When do you use it? And I was like, well, you, well, you say skanaa. You say slowly. And he goes, that's it. That's what it is. And it, when you put all of that together, it's like thinking things through slowly, so that you have put forward the best thoughts, the best intentions for those who are coming, th for those who are not yet here. And it's when you think about it in terms of the tree, like and, and that and that song, what she talks about is she goes like, we have to like we have to like we have to com be camaraderie with each other and not let this tree fall. So it's it's interesting that you talked about like re-standing up the tree because we talk about that a lot to like our students too. Like like I said, I'm I'm a teacher, but I, I teach grade I only teach grade two, but my sister my my daughter is in grade six. And her, ta her teacher talks to her about that often, about how preserving the culture and preserving the language is upholding this tree. So we could have re-stood those four trees that fell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one other set of questions, quickly, if you don't mind. Um, I love sibling trees, mm -hmm. and there are two massive, I think of them as siblings, brother and sister or brothers or whatever, in Casanova Park, which is in South Buffalo, a couple blocks from where I live. I'm not too sure about the medicinal or the functional use. Um, and unfortunately, just because of like when we were like after the War of 1812, or well, when our like when our nation was relocated to where we are currently in Six Nations, um, which is near like kind of like near Brantford and Caledonia, Ontario, um, and away from our homelands, we actually don't really have very many sycamore trees. So a lot of the knowledge that we would have had. Um, and relationship with this tree was a little bit lost, I think, within that move. So unfortunately, like perhaps like like I want to say maybe like Onondagas or like or like other nations that stayed within upstate New York might have a little bit more of that that missing information. But because of the move and because of like this the shift out of those geographical locations, like the, some knowledge was likely lost. Yeah, <clears throat> pardon me. And I'm not sure um, if I noticed it being more this year, especially, but they do tend to peel their layers of their bark. So, you know, you can see it's it's almost like the further out you go from the tree, the darker and tougher the bark tends to be. And I've even seen a sycamore before where it, w it looked pure white and all of the bark basically had been peeled off over time. Um, it's not 
so I would imagine it's not necessarily unhealthy for the tree or anything like that. Um, I'm not sure if weather patterns or anything like that might influence its growth, its girth, kind of pushing those layers of bark away from itself. But uh, but it's an interesting it's an interesting point because I have noticed quite a lot of the of the sheddings this year as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I should say that uh, because we have sycamore a bit somewhere, not too far from where I live, and uh, I walk very often on that path and. Uh, I should say this year they came faster a little bit compared to the previous year. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it may be a question, yeah, the weather, we had very, well, we had eight, we eight heat waves <laughs> this year. So it may be uh, related to that. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it's also, well, many trees, like we, many trees right now are losing leaves. And uh, the reason is not because it's the fall, it's because it had, they had heat stress. So that's another component. Yeah, and I think especially because, like I said, like I'm, I kind of entered through understanding plants through mycology, through like the study of mushrooms, and I am a, I'm like a forager. So <laughs> like this year was like a really terrible year for mushrooms because like the um, just because of the lack of the lack of rain, the lack of rain and the intense heat. Because like mushrooms like a, a very specific climate in order to thrive, but it makes you really realize like kind of like the con how connected all of those things are. Like you know like extreme heat wave. Like I always I whenever I hear somebody, I swear so I've I've heard it so many times where people are like, oh it's raining, and you're like oh my gosh thank heavens yeah. for the rain like please like please we don't want it to go away because like I, we, we don't realize what a finite system we live in mm -hmm. that like you you need you need rain you need rain f in order for s for things to grow in order for things to thrive and things that we rely on and so like i'm i'm to be honest i'm like i'm always so grateful so grateful when it rains and for when it thunders because you know that in, like well obviously for me i know that there's going to be mushrooms in the forest the next day <laughs> or in the next few days but um mostly because like there there is like a certain balance and a certain order and a certain respect that like all of these things in creation to serve serve deserve for the purpose that they serve mm -hmm. at, um here in here on um here on the earth so i always like kind of think about like kind of think about those things like at all like the connections between all of those things mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I know you mean as well, like with the purpose that they serve, that's not necessarily a um, anthropocentric viewpoint. That's a the purpose that they serve for each other as well. You know, like the mushrooms and the trees are so closely related. So if one's not doing well, that reflects on the other. And along with you know so many of the different um, organisms that are that are within the ecosystem, it's all so closely connected. I, well, I can just say probably one thing. Stay tuned for tomorrow at 1 o'clock. <laughs> that may probably <laughs> help. <laughs> I want to say that I think I've always, like, I, I used to live in Niagara on the Lake for a number of years. Um, and I think I was always astonished at how little information there was, mm -hmm. like, about our culture and about how important this region is. And like, and how beautiful like our stories are at like that there was like, you know, that nobody knew like, why was it called the Rainbow Bridge? Or why was it called the Peace Bridge? Or why is it called Made of the Mist? Like there's all of these ways that our, our culture has informed this and shaped this territory. And, and people seem to know very little about it. So I was so happy when like, when Tim started, <laughs> started doing all of these like different projects to help really, 
reignite and really bring to the forefront so much how all like the history and all the culture and how beautiful this region is so it was really wonderful for me to be a like be a part of this because I think that knowing these names and and knowing kind of like what you know these are trails that my ancestors walked and that these are these are plants that they probably picked like these are medicines that they probably utilized I think that kind of just draws my like connection to the territory like even more than like well I want to say like there was always an appreciation there but it's it's broadened it and I I hope that like it will I guess continue to like to highlight what a what like the richness that it has and the richness that it carries and I hope that that will be able to be passed on to to those who are coming I don't know if that answered your question or not but <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you uh, so much. I think uh, you, what a wonderful presentation. And one of the things that we were looking for uh, at Plenty Canada and uh, also the educational work we've been doing in the Niagara region, we did a lot of the, uh, the history work and so forth, but uh, within the school systems, the science, right? And how to find that that connection between indigenous knowledge and Western science. And this presentation that you just witnessed here is a prime example of how those two systems of knowledge can come together. And what you realize, uh, you know, Alyssa's really keen interest in language and what that language means and what information is embedded within in that language is really crucial. And so uh, this is really delivered for us absolutely beautifully because we want to come back around and, and develop some educational programming around it that fits within the Ontario curriculum, but really finds you know, significant connections, the nexus between the knowledge systems around things that can be considered science. And what you guys have done here is you know, just remarkable and perhaps the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I know that you identified uh, more plants than what we saw today, right? How, how many plants, indigenous plants, did you find? About 115. 115 indigenous plants along the Lower Secord Legacy Trail, which is uh, really, uh, really significant. So uh, if we could uh, thank our uh, panelists today, Liette, Alyssa, and Kasia. Thank you for doing such a wonderful job. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it.